Good afternoon. Welcome to TEDx, The Sustainable Future, an afternoon of talks about the future of sustainable energy. First, a couple of announcements. May we ask that you please turn off your mobile phone at this time and any other devices that may disrupt. Also, one of the speakers has had to cancel his participation, unfortunately. Mr. Moot informed us that he is unable to join us today due to unforeseen circumstances. Your MC this afternoon is Patricia Martin. Patricia is a 12th grade student at St. John's, and she was offered a place to study chemical engineering at Cambridge University. In addition to being an excellent academic student, she's also a very talented singer. Please welcome Patricia. So welcome to our TEDx event on the sustainable future. We have a very exciting speaker lineup prepared for you, and I hope you will enjoy this afternoon as much as I expect to enjoy it. So before we start, I'd like to thank our sponsors without whom this event wouldn't be possible, and also our diamond sponsor, Accenture. Our first speaker comes to us from Germany, Hans-Josef Fell is the German politician often referred to as the father of sustainable energy and he played a key role in the development of Germany's renewable energy policy, which has delivered its 2020 goals 10 years ahead of time. Please join me in welcoming Hans-Josef Fell. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure for me to stay with you and share with you my ideas for a new sustainable world. Thank you very much for invitation here to that and for this organization. It is very great what I could hear about this. Please notice I'm not a native speaker, so allow me to make some mistakes in grammatics and pronouncing. My teacher in school told me you never will learn English, so I hope, <laughs> I hope you can understand my English and allow me to make some mistakes. Global warming, we see the Earth has fever. We don't like this fever because at the moment, 
At 0 0.8 degrees Celsius global warming, we see a lot of disasters, floods, hurricanes, bad harvests, smelting of pole ice caps, rising sea level, we see migration flows and others. And then I see a strategy of climate protection that is called we should accept global warming till two degrees. What will happen with the world when we see the disasters today? When we will see two degrees global warming? I find it unacceptable. So we have to seek, it is, is it possible not to accept global warming but to go to another strategy, global cooling, to bring down the temperature of the Earth from today to a lower level, not coming back to ice area, but to a region that was about 100 years ago. This would be sustainable for the planet. And I believe this is possible. When we look, to the nature aspects, what would be necessary for a global cooling strategy, we have to look to global concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Today we stay about at 400 parts per million. This is a measure for how many greenhouse gases are already in the atmosphere. And 400 parts per million is a lot. 200 years ago, before the industry age, we had 280 parts per million in the atmosphere. And the last time when the Earth had 400 parts per million, about three billion years ago, it was very warm in the Earth. The sea level was 80 meter higher than today. Greenland was ice free. And in Canada, we looked to tropical rainwoods. I think we should not accept this because global warming follows up with the time lag to the increasing of concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. We have to bring them down, perhaps to 330 parts per million. How is it possible? Two pillars are necessary. First pillar is we have to stop all emissions. Emissions reduction is not enough because emissions on a lower level higher the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So we have to stop it. Go to a zero emission world. I will tell more about it I see we are very on a very good work, way on this to come to a zero emission world. But this is not enough because of the high concentration of the atmosphere today. Therefore, the second pillar is to take out carbon from the atmosphere and to lower the concentration. Both pillars are possible Within some decades, we could organize it on the world. It is necessary, and I tell you, it is on an economical way profitable and benefitable. Yes, I know most of you and of the other peoples now say, it is crazy, it is impossible, unrealistic. I know these arguments with unrealistic ideas and strategies. In 2000, I proposed for the German parliament a new law for renewable energies with feed-in tariff law. The economists and the energy experts told me and my colleagues in the German parliament, it is ridiculous. This renewable energies, you would come to a world that would be completely served by renewable energies. 
it is impossible. It is impossible because renewables are so expensive. We have no industry for them to produce the products. The people don't know about it. Where are the companies? Yes, 15 years ago we had this situation. But today it is completely otherwise. 15 years later, because of the Renewable Energy Act in Germany and other countries who supported renewable energies, now we have a mass production of renewable technologies. Now renewables are much cheaper than 15 years ago. The price for solar dropped 10 times in 15 years down. Now, Renewables are cheaper when we look to the investment to wind power and solar power compared with the new investment into nuclear power and coal power station. Look to Bloomberg, they make good scientific report about the economy. The switch in the world is already done. Now, new investment into renewables is cheaper than new investment into conventional energies. I see it today, I'm a happy day for me today. In my hometown, near my hometown, is a great nuclear power plant, Grafen Rheinfeld. Today, the operator announced to close it down earlier than the force of the law would bring them. The reason is, nuclear power is uncompetitive with renewable energies. Renewable energies are too cheap. And renewable energies, we have so many in Germany that they cannot sell on a profitable level nuclear power electricity from Grafen Rheinfeld. Today, 15 years later, so fast can grow a new technology, a zero emission technology. And we see it in Germany. We had 6% electricity in 2000 coming from renewables, and today we have 25%. And when the same increasing rates goes on, we will see 100% renewable shares share by 2030. And don't believe the propaganda of the old economists from coal and nuclear power, natural gas and oil power, that renewables would increase the price. No, the reality is renewables decrease the electricity price on the stock market in Germany. And this is why a lot of companies and others, even from abroad, from Belgium, Netherlands, from France and others, buy now German electricity because it is cheaper than the homemade from other one. It is a huge success story. And this is not only in Germany. Look to China. China copied, like other hundred nations in the world, the fit-in tariff law, what we proposed in 2000 and introduced 2000 into the German parliament. And last year, China was the first time with more investing into renewables than in coal and nuclear power. 60% in renewables, 40% in coal and nuclear power. The switch already goes in other countries. And you can imagine, we are at the beginning of the innovation period of renewable energies. The price will come down faster and faster, and we will see more dropping down the renewable prices in the next years, and increasing prices of the conventional energies because they are scarce, and they pollute the environment, they make a lot of burdens. Look to the crisis, what we have now with the European Union and Russia because of the dependency of natural gas and oil. The dependency from fossil raw materials is much more a problem than only polluting the climate. So we can come very fast out of this. This is a wonderful idea to go to a very fast zero emission world with renewable energies. But it is not only necessary in the electricity system. We need it also in heating system, cooling system, and in transport system. We are not so far in the success story like in the electricity system in the other 
parts, but it is also possible with electric cars in transport system, with biofuels, but we must look to biofuels to a sustainable way, not cutting rainwoods, not competition with food production, but it is possible to go with a sustainable way also with biofuels, and we could replace it. And we must create a zero emission chemistry, and chemistry that is independent from oil resources to make plastics and other chemical products. 10% of the worldwide chemical products are already natural renewables coming from plants. This is the way what we have to go faster. So we can see a zero emission world is possible on an economic level because of the economic problems of the fossil and nuclear resources. But how to come to the second pillar? Taking out carbon from the atmosphere. It is also possible. Plants take out carbon from the atmosphere when they grow. We should organize a plant management that the captured carbon from the atmosphere stored in the plant now do not go back to the atmosphere. We should store it in the upper soil regions. This brings carbon to the soil and makes, makes the soil much more fertilized. It is a normal process. With organic farming, we can accelerate it instead of intensive farming that destroys the humus in the soil. We can accelerate it with reforestry in the world that takes a lot of carbon out of the atmosphere. But the natural process goes too slow. We must accelerate it also by a technology introduced process. And it is possible. We have a very new technology. It is called make biocoal or biochar from plants with pyrolysis or better with hydrothermal carbonization. A very new technology that most people don't know this. But it is already in the first investment in Germany, in China, and also in USA. This hydrothermal carbonization makes from plants biocoal. It is a process what we can see from the nature. When the wood goes down to the underground, they created mineral coal in three billion years. Hydrothermal carbonization makes the same process in three hours, not in three billion years. And then we have a wonderful basic material. This biocoal could replace mineral coal in coal power plants. They could add the electricity when we have the gap from solar and wind fluctuations, take biocoal, add it in these hours where solar and wind is too less. We could take this biocoal also as replacing mineral oil and natural gas in chemical products. There is a new build-up biocoal hydrothermal carbonization station in Freiburg in Germany. Next month, the build-up will begin. The construction of this will begin. And the products from it goes to DuPont to replace mineral oil in creating carbon chemical products. But the third way, beside of energy, chemical products, the third way is the best one. Take this biocoal, bring it to the soil. This brings not only stored carbon that was in earlier time in the atmosphere, no. It brings a fertilizing to the soil. Much more results. Perhaps you have heard of 
South American soils in Amazonas regions, terra preta called. A papaya fruit is on this soil 20 times higher with the yields than beside of the other areas. The secret behind this fertilized soil is it is high density with carbon. And this carbon came, the Incas made it, former from the atmospheres captured by the plants and stored in the soil. We could replace millions of square kilometers in the world with carbon from the atmosphere captured by the plants to make these areas more fertilized, to bring more yields for food and for energy, to save this country, to bring to cooperatives more and more of these new yields. And then we have the strategy. Zero emission with renewable energy, with renewable chemistry, with renewable transport sector, and taking out carbon, making biocoal from plants, and fertilize the world. The benefits are great. We have then a healthy food with organic farming. We have no polluting the air with a lot of materials that make us sick from coal power station and combustion engines in the cars. We have a lot of undependency from fossil raw materials from abroad, our homemade energy system. We must not fight over the raw materials, make old wars or others. And this all is combined with a strategy that we could save the climate by global cooling. What should we do more? The biggest problems of the world are combined solution with it. And the world is on the best way to do it. Because now it is cheaper to go to renewables than to conventional energies. Now it is cheaper and more profitable in the future to go to a stored carbon from the atmosphere to the soil and fertilize the agriculture. We are on the best way. And the best way is not to make an agreement worldwide on climate conferences for this strategy. It is okay when every one of you and the other peoples do it. And the most want to do it because they would like cheap energy and other cheap products. We must not wait for climate conferences agreement. We can do it nationwide, personally, with a lot of companies, and therefore I'm hopeful. It will come. Renewables combined with taking out from the carbon within some decades. We can accelerate it this way, and then we have a global cooling in some decades. Or we can refuse this way, and then we will lose the game with global warming. No, that's not my way. And I hope you will join this way too. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, or as the Germans say, vielen Dank for this inspiring talk. Next up, we will have Sandrine dixon Diklev from the University of Cambridge. She teaches executives on sustainability and climate leadership at the Cambridge Program for Sustainability Leadership, as well as running the Prince of Wales EU Corporate Leaders Group on Climate Change. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to take you down a slightly different path than the previous speaker and more talk about a personal journey. And the personal journey really starts in California, where I was lucky enough to grow up. 
And as a Californian, well, actually a Belgian, if you haven't noticed from my joint name, having emigrated to California, I was very much told by my teachers and pushed in the direction of sustainability already at a very young age, because California as a state was already going in that direction in the 60s and the 70s. And that actually started to form me as a young teenager when I became a pushy environmentalist and told my parents that they couldn't buy tuna fish that was fished with dolphins, that they couldn't litter, and that they had to recycle. But at the same time, what my teachers were telling me, and also was key to my formation, was that the world was my oyster. And that I, as a person, and as a woman, or a young girl, could really do anything I wanted, both in terms of protecting the planet, but also taking risks and going out there and driving key leadership opportunities. I moved from California to Belgium, and my kids continue to bother me about that. They do wonder what the heck possessed me to come to Brussels. Actually, I was offered the opportunity to work in the European Commission and to work in an area that really compelled me, which was around trade and the environment. And after that internship in the European Commission, I then started to work with global legislators who were working in the area of the environment, but not just here in the European Commission and the Parliament, but also in Japan, in Russia, and in the United States. And had the distinct honor of being able to work with Al Gore and John Kerry and some very prominent politicians today in the United States. And what I realized at that time, also because I started my master's in environmental sciences, was I started to move into three key revelations. The first, and I apologize because I thought that we'd have a few more youth amongst us, was the fact that sustainable development is like teenage sex. Everyone claims they're doing it, but either they're doing it badly or they're not doing it at all. <laughs> and this was actually already in the 90s. And I would say, based on what we've just heard from the previous speaker, continues to be very true today. Why is that? Why was it that we couldn't find those compelling cases to get involved in sustainable development? Even though I was traveling with parliamentarians from across the globe that were dedicated, we were still seeing whaling in Japan and we weren't able to stop it. Al Gore had already started talking about climate change. We're still talking about climate change. And I think the key issue was my second revelation, which was basically that sustainable development continues to be like teenage sex because everyone knows it's less exciting than it should or could be. Somehow, we're not creating that compelling narrative to bring people, to bring corporations, and to bring policymakers on board. Somehow, we're lacking all of the evidence, but not just the technological evidence, the compelling reason why we should do this. And luckily, in my newest stint of working for the University of Cambridge, and also for His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales, I've been given the opportunity to put in place a series of different types of projects, working with corporate leaders, but also with policymakers, towards creating a new type of narrative that's built upon, yes, we do have the technology. Yes, we do have the possibility of moving forward. We have the policy and we have the solutions. But what we need still is somehow to convince the citizen and to broaden this narrative, to bring on board onto this journey more policymakers and more corporations. One of the projects that I find, and I'm sorry you can't see this very well, so compelling, is that I was able to work with some key corporations and schools around Europe on a project called the Atlas Toolkit. And the Atlas Toolkit basically was a very simple toolkit that allowed different students in different school settings, so all the way from primary to secondary, to measure their own emissions. And what did this do? Well, first of all, instead of talking about the theory of technology 
or instead of talking about the gloom and doom of climate change. It allowed them to see firsthand what their own impacts were. But then moving from the impacts, it also allowed them to understand what the solutions were. So changing this gloom and doom diatribe into, wow, actually, there are lots of possible solutions out there. And what was fascinating was beyond just our simple toolkit, was the collaborative spirit between these children and their principals to completely change the environment in which they were working, studying in. This particular example is a school in the Netherlands. And I think all of us who visited that school were completely taken on board by the excitement of the children and the principal. The principal truly had a vision, which was he was going to make his school the first zero emission school in the Netherlands. And he brought those children on that vision. He told them it was possible. But what was fantastic was not only that they got all the best technology into this building, that they were able to achieve their goal. It was all the knockoff effects. Those kids, most of them who are refugees or immigrants, learned that by working in this project together, they also were able to bring in the community. Their parents got involved. Their friends got involved. The school actually made a point of growing an organic garden and bringing in the entire community to participate in the initiative. They built a brand new sustainable pro, um, platform and, uh, and playground for those kids to be able to play all week long. The school gates were open, the children and the families could go into the garden and take advantage of the entire setting. Beyond that, the children started to learn better. Now, how is that possible? Actually, the new lighting system that had been put in there, developed by Philips, is proven to show that concentration levels can go up by 30% just by the type of lead lighting that you have, but also the way in which you can bring in different light at different times. But beyond just the lighting, what these children were finding out was that this brand new environment made them feel better. That was something to get excited about. So starting to translate a very simple toolkit into a brand new experience was what we saw and corporations saw as the real way to move from just knowing that we need to do something about it to actually translating that into a really incredible new experience. And if I come back to the world is your oyster, what we were developing with these kids is they were realizing that yes, the world was their oyster. They were able to transform their own world, but also they were able to make a better world. And it wasn't that difficult. And they started to work also with a woman in the middle who you may not recognize, but actually is Princess Laurentine of the Netherlands. And Princess Laurentine took this whole idea even further because she was so taken by the excitement of these kids. And she's working with them now to start to challenge major corporations in the Netherlands. She's taking children and youth from different schools and she's working with them to start to push and prod those leaders in the different corporations by asking them very challenging questions. Because beyond just the experience that we had of how enthusiastic these kids were, one thing we did realize is that typically, as we become young leaders and then older leaders, we lose sight of all of that enthusiasm that those kids had. We lose sight of the fact that they go blindly towards possible challenges and they never think twice about the fact that they can't achieve them. Somehow we've been blunted as we grow older into a theory that we can't necessarily achieve that because it's too costly. Or maybe as a banker I'm going to lose my bonus. Or maybe my shareholders won't approve with what I'm doing. Never do we just decide to take those risks like we should. 
And I shouldn't say never, because some corporations obviously are. And some are being led by some incredible leaders. And so that is my third key revelation, is leadership. Leadership is the missing formula. It's not technology. We have it. It's not anything that is really keeping us down, even from a cost perspective. Because we can do the economics. What really is happening is that somehow we don't have enough leaders who are able to translate that exciting message into a new path, into a new vision. And that's what we need now. So we need to continue to educate those young leaders. We need to have more cases like this where school children are totally transforming their vision and trying to take risks and moving forward and understanding the benefits of what a low carbon or more sustainable economy is because they're living it. And we need to bring that into the boardroom. And we need to bring that into the European Commission and into ministries. And I think one thing we definitely need to do is we need to figure out how we start having real integrated conversations. Because whether it be in the boardroom, one of the things that we continuously are confronted with when we do our executive training is that, yes, we've put in place a nice little position for the sustainability officer. But that sustainability officer, first of all, most of the time is not very well respected in the corporation, doesn't have the power to make real decisions, and isn't even listened to by the head of finance or even by the CEO. Somehow, we need to completely change that. Sustainability must be fully operational across the company. And that's where we're seeing real leadership in corporations. Corporations who have already started to completely change the model that they previously had, where they're integrating sustainability across their bottom line and through their entire value chain. When we start to work with leaders, we actually hit them with some pretty hard questions. And at the last seminar that we gave here in Brussels, one of our ethics teachers kept on asking our corporate leaders whether they were constantly mired in the gray area or whether they could really see the difference between black and white. And if you look at these images, it's pretty tough. Here we have angels in black and the devil in white. Here we have angels in white, and the devil in black. And the key question our ethics teacher asked these corporate leaders was, why is it that so many people that walk out the door of their home take off their mother and father hat, the protector hat, the value hat, the one that's trying to make sure that we do the right thing and start to think about profit and greed and making sure that actually they just follow what they're being told. Is that a real leader? Now the real leader, and most of our studies have definite, definitely demonstrated this, is the one who understands first of all that yes, we do need to make business if we're gonna stay in business. But also, yes, I need to be a good mother and father at home and at work. I need to try to bring my entire staff on this journey and make it make sense, but I'm gonna continue to lead because I know this is right. I'm not gonna get mired in that gray area. I'm gonna move forward because that is what we need to move from just the world is your oyster to the world is your home. And so I leave you with that message. And I hope that you will be able to continue yourselves to live with that mantra. Thank you. Thank you again for this very different but yet very inspiring speech. And next up we will have Martin Mikjelsen, the CEO of Eco Nation whose innovative light catcher product earned him numerous prestigious awards in 2014, including the 2014 Technology Pioneer by the World Economic Forum 
and the Bloomberg New Energy P Pioneer for 2014. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, in the beginning there was darkness and God said, um, let there be light and there was light. Now, what God didn't say is how to get this light into a building. And that's where innovation comes in. Um, we're at EcoNation. Um, well, we, we do something about innovation. I'm here to tell you a thing or two about this. First of all, innovation is a long word to say something um, very simple. It means make something better. Not only make it better, but make it extremely better. For us, innovation is not about um, making, improving something by 10%, but it's about making it 10 times better. Now back to, to daylight. So how do you get this light into a building? Um, innovation is relative. I mean, many decades ago, people thought, let's just put some transparent thing on your roof and the light enters. And that's right. And that was innovation at that time. But only it had many disadvantages. Not only do you have um, light entering your building, but also all the heat. It gets very hot inside. Or you get burglars, you get thieves entering your building through your roof because it's not burglar proof. So it came with many disadvantages, and, and so we're back at square one. I mean, it, it wasn't a great solution. But what we see today as, as rather stupid or simple, it was innovative at that time. Now what we came up with, with Econation, was a intelligent skylight. Very simple. And that's the whole point. I mean, innovation can be simple. Um, I'm not an engineer. I studied Germanic languages. Just as for the first speaker, my professor told me I would never be able to, to speak English. Innovation by, starts by not accepting something is impossible, by a simple idea. What we have comes from the cavemen. I mean, cavemen had, had mirrors in front of their um, cave just to, to bring down the light as, as far as possible and then have uh, optimal, optimal um, daylight into their caves and bright spaces. The only innovative thing is how will we move these mirrors so that they catch the sun or that they um, uh, find the optimal light spot all day long. And, and quite early in the process, the calculation made clear it would be too expensive to hire employees to rotate the mirrors all day long, every day of the year. So we had to find something different. Uh, that was light sensor technology. So we developed a light sensor technology so that we could rotate those mirrors automatically, wirelessly. And once we were there, we measured the light. We would at the same time measure the light intensity at the inside of the building, because then that's where you can switch off the light. It doesn't make sense to enter daylight and then still have all the light fittings switched on. So wirelessly, we switch off the light fittings. So we ended up with this uh, light catcher technology, and we thought we made some calculations. Our first customer had a payback period of less than three years. We thought we would be millionaires within months, if not weeks. The money would flow in at a, at a, at a faster, I'm sorry, the money would flow in at a faster rate than uh, we could ever catch up with. Well, at least that's what, uh, what we thought, but in reality, it was the other way around. I mean, the money flew out at a faster rate than we could ever cope with. And that's, that's when we really learned what innovation is. I mean, I once learned that innovation is the, um, the ability to convert an idea into an invoice. Well, the invoices went the other way around. That was not the perfect solution for us. But it's true, so we had to really reinvent and rethink ourselves. Um, that's when we came up with something different. And, and today we say instead of selling skylights, we have to do something different. Because innovation, I mean, it means you get, you collect all your savings, all your money from your savings deposit. You bring it into an idea, you develop it, or your pockets are empty already, hopefully you have a proof of concept, hopefully that turns out to be a prototype, and by then you're, you really have empty pockets. You come to this market, you think we have a huge win, but the market doesn't care, because they don't know your product, they don't want to run the risk, and just you have a solution for a problem that they are not even aware of. So then the marketing department comes in and they say, give us this amount of money and we will make sure that the market works, but your pockets are empty. So we had to reinvent ourselves. We had um, the highest efficiency, the shortest payback period, but the market simply didn't care because we came to this market in terms of crisis. Um, companies didn't want to invest. 
they didn't have the budgets or it wasn't the priority. They want to invest in people and machines, but not in their roofs, not in their lights, not in their energy efficiency. All companies want to save, but not all of them are willing to invest. And that was a huge problem for us. Well, at the end of the day, it was a huge opportunity because all of them are willing to save. And the investment, you just have to work it out differently. Today, we go to customers and we say, um, yes, we will save with you. We will install our technology on your roofs. And we understand you don't want to run the risk. We understand you don't want to invest in this. Keep on investing in your employees. We will take care of this. We absorb the investment. <coughs> we invest in your place. We invest in your roof. We will um, combine our technology with the artificial light fittings. We will switch off these light fittings. We will monitor the savings we generate. And part of these savings are invoiced to you. Instead of asking customers to um, buy a skylight, which they don't care for, which they don't want to invest in, we say, we will invest in your savings and we will share the savings with you. Now, as of today, we are active in um, 12 countries. We have uh, offices in three continents. We have customers from very small SMEs to huge multinationals. And most of all, um, we charge our customers today with something that is normally free. We ask money for free daylight. That's what we call innovation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up, we have Jan Düring representing the research organization Vito, and he will present their study about the probability of Belgium making a full transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy by 2050. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for this uh, introduction. You know me now, but I don't know who you are. Um, and this is making, making my presentation maybe a little bit difficult. Um, but the subject is clear. The subject is Belgium renewable by 2050, and it is with a question mark. And this question mark is important. I'm, maybe I'm going to disappoint you because I'm not going to answer this question. I will explain later on why I will not give a final answer to this question. But I'm going to do something which is much better. I'm going to give you the elements that you can make your own opinion about this issue. And I think this is more important than giving you this answer. But first, I have to start with a story. In 2012, Vito and two other institutes, the Belgium Federal uh, Planning Bureau and ESET, which is a Walloon Institute, made a study on this issue. And this study, it was asked by four Belgium ministers responsible for energy. Yes, we have many of that. <laughs> it, was only, or it was remarkable that four ministers for, responsible for energy joined their forces to ask for this study. And when this question came to us, my first reaction was, was not so positive. I, my first idea was, that it was impossible. And why? Because, mainly because renewable conditions in Belgium are not very favorable. For instance, we don't have that many hydro energy. The sun is shining in the summer, but not in the winter. And we don't have that much place to put that many windmills like they have in Germany. So we are facing a lot of additional problems we have to solve. So my first reaction was negative. I said, this is the most stupid question they ever asked me. But of course, as a researcher, you are always triggered by the research question. And so we started investigating this problem. 
First, by making ordinary calculations, how many windmills we need, how many solar powers we need, how many deep geothermal energy we can extract, see whether this is all sufficient. But this is not giving the complete answer. It is part of the picture. Because the point is not only to produce sufficient amounts of energy, the point is to make this energy available when it is required. And this is far more difficult than just defining how much energy we need. We used a very useful computer model to make all our calculations. And it took, it was a quite in intensive job, you know. But after one year, we succeeded. And we designed five different scenarios, five different, to make, well, for a transition towards a 100% renewable uh, economy in Belgium. So, from a technical point, it is possible. And it was done only with proven technologies, not technologies that will have to be invented in 10 or 20 years, no, only existing technologies. Then, of course, we made a complete design of this energy system for 2050, and we also made the whole transition path towards this uh, system. We made the calculations about the efforts, and it was enormously. To realize this transition in Belgium, our calculations point, we can't point it out that we have to do about 350 billion euros of investments. Do you know how much that is? 350 billion euros? This is quite easy to remember. This is one times the Belgium GDP. And this we have to invest in a period of 35 or maybe 40 years. So this is really huge. We also know how the system could look like. We know that electricity will become the major energy power. And electricity will be multiplied, electric, electricity production will be multiplied by a factor two to three in such a system. Electricity ca production capacities, which will be based on renewables of course, will be multiplied, the capacities will be, it will be, well, it is a factor three to five or maybe even seven in some of these scenarios. But if you look at the cost at a yearly basis, because yes, 350 billion, then we also see the savings. And there are very important savings because we do not have to spend any more, any money on fossil fuels. So we also made the calculations on a yearly basis and by 2050, we pointed out that the cost of such a system would be between two and 3% of the GDP. Two or three percent of the GDP, it's not that much. I mean, if you look at our government, every year they are able to save one or two percent to get their budget right. So two to three percent spending, additional spending on the energy system should not be really a very big problem. The question is, do we want it? There, in our opinion, there is still a cost on such a system. But then we have to look at additional benefits. And there are a few ones. First, such a system would last forever. Do you know how long that is? Forever. So that means that our children and our grandchildren will greatly benefit if we now start developing such a system because there will not be any energy scarcity for them. Secondly, <coughs> in the current situation, it looks like it's the only way we can use, the only option, real, realistic option we have to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. 
course, there's also energy efficiency. But energy efficiency and renewable energy, they are combining very well. Thirdly, it will make us independent for our energy system. All the people will probably remember the period 73, the oil crisis, the fall, uh, and then the subsequent oil crisis afterwards. It took many, many years to recover from this oil shock. And more recently, even this month, we have been confronted with the fact that being dependent for our energy, energy is not such a luxury situation. Now, an additional, two additional benefits from a renewable system. First, it will produce clean air. Imagine that you walk in Brussels and yet you have the air quality you can now only uh, taste in the mountains in Switzerland. That is feasible with renewable energy and many people will benefit from that as well. And the last thing is that renewable energy will create far more local jobs than a fossil phase, than an energy system based on fossil fuels. So, these are the elements, and still I'm not able to give you an answer. Why? Because in my title, I have two figures, and figures are dangerous. The first one is 100%. If we do, if we have a smart, if we follow a smart strategy to realize this, then we start by taking the low hanging fruits first. If we continue with the strategy, then of course it means then maybe if we have 90 or 95% renewables, that the additional measures we have to take unless, unless we have new technologies, but the additional costs involved to realize this 5% or 10% might be quite expensive. So I'm not completely convinced that we have to go for 100%, but maybe for 95%, but I can't give you a final answer on this because I haven't made the calculations yet. Second figure. 2050, and this is even more difficult than the first figure. The point is that we will not realize this if not everybody is convinced about the sustainability and the feasibility of a renewable system. And good ideas may take, may take a long, long time bef before they get realized and before they get accepted by everybody. And that is basically the reasons why I cannot give you a final answer to this question. But I'm very grateful that today I had the opportunity to convince you that we are going, and I'm sure we are going in the right direction. Thank you. We have now reached our networking break, so if you have any questions for the speakers, feel free to talk to them. I'm sure they'll be sure to help, help you. And refreshments will be served in the foyer when you exit on your right. Thank you.
Mana fila bembali le ay de menyoma Jamana dinu bembali le ay de menyoma Mama no balo te ala ay de menama Dime che dinte chigi ala ay de menama De menyoma bi mogoya De menyoma le Sana kuya, oye temendo ye. Jati kia, oye temendo ye. Kile kile na, kile kile wa, kile kile ni, anye kile kile wa la. Tu mani ke. Ah, can't 
Wajiaye mali le tuye tarapu wajiaye Wajiaye mali le tuye tarapu wajiaye Jenesi teto Arime teto Sede yao teto Arime teto tarapu wajiaye Wajiaye Mali le tuye tarapu wajiaye Wajiaye Mali le tuye tarapu wajiaye
kabiri memba lutilo afole kabiri mama lutilo afole funelu to homo pamegemba to your girlfriend she speak me but I don't know what's up then
Again, we will now begin the second half of our program, and I'd like to invite Tim de Moray from the University of Delft racing team. He is the team, team manager of the Formula student race team, and his team just broke the world record for acceleration from zero to 100 kilometers per hour. I'll let you, I'll let him tell you more about that now. Thank you. <laughs> Well, indeed, we built the fastest electric vehicle. We're not a Porsche or Tesla, or we are just a group of students who um, yeah, love to build a race car from the Delft University of Technology. A Formula One car can accelerate in about 2.5 seconds from zero to 100 kilometers an hour. And our car accelerated in 2.1 seconds from zero to 100 kilometers an hour. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. <laughs> and um, yeah, my presentation will be mainly about the students who do this, so the students who make those things and who will probably in the future make all those uh, sustainability problems uh, go away. Uh, so um, 
As uh, I was introduced, I'm the team manager of the most awesome project uh, there is, Formula Student. Now, Formula Student is an international design competition. Um, all over the world, there are about 500 teams who participate in this competition. And each year, they accept the challenge to design, manufacture, and race their own race car. But yeah, why do they do this? Why do we do this? Yeah, we are with a team of 86 students that accepted this challenge. And the sole reason why we do this is that we want to acquire knowledge to become better engineers, to become the most qualified engineers in the world to solve all the problems that we are facing today. Um, in Delft, we have a unique way of solving or of uh, creating these engineers. Um, we namely encourage all the students to work on different projects, to be entrepreneurial. And with these projects, which students do uh, besides their studies, um, they like to yeah, acquire the tools and the skills to work on real life and practical problems. Getting the theoretical knowledge from the university and putting it into practice. Well, that's, in my opinion, one of the reason, main reasons why yeah, Delft University of Technology is such a good uh, university. But of course, I'm a student there, so I uh, really should say that. Um, and um, there are a lot of awesome projects there. We have a Dream Hall, which is uh, yeah, some sort of a workshop where we have about 15 student projects. And um, amongst others, we have the uh, Human Power Team, for instance, which is a, uh, a team that builds the fastest bike in the world, a bike that can go a top speed of 133.8 kilometers an hour, only on human power. Uh, we have the Eco Runner, which is a car that can drive 3,000 kilometers on the equivalent of one liter of fuel. We have uh, a solar-powered car from the Nuance Solar Team, um, and they recently won the uh, World Solar Challenge in uh, Australia. Um, and of course, we have our team, uh, the most awesome team. Uh, <laughs> and um, yeah, we built race cars already for 14 years. So we started in 2001 with a relatively heavy four-cylinder petrol engine car, just, since, just because the students wanted to learn how to yeah, apply their, their theoretical knowledge into practice. And um, after building two of those relatively heavy cars, we found that yeah, we needed something to distinguish ourselves and to become faster and more efficient. And that's, yeah, the re the, what we then decided to do was build an extremely lightweight car. And of course, as you can imagine, if you have less mass, you need less energy to propel yourself. And you, need, and you can also go faster through corners because you need to change direction with a lot less uh, mass than uh, um, if you have a heavy car. And we did so with the DUT-03 in 2003, which was a, um, at that time, the, the competition weighed about 240 kilograms on average, the cars. And our car weighed 125 kilograms, almost 100 kilograms, more than 100 kilograms lighter than the rest of the competition. Unfortunately, this car was not very reliable, but um, it, was, it had such a good design philosophy that it won the Engineering Design Award in the competition, which is the award for the best design. And that made us, yeah, we, then we kept on applying this, this, this concept. And um, until 2008, when we decided that we wanted to get more out of our, our, our engine, and we went for bioethanol. Bioethanol is yeah, more environmentally friendly, but it can also get more power out of your engine. And yeah, when we evolved our cars until 2010, we got a car that was extremely lightweight. It weighed 137 kilograms. It's a bit heavier than in 2003 because also the, yeah, the safety regulations uh, of the competitions uh, became a bit tighter. Um, and the car was yeah, so lightweight that it won our endurance race of 10 to 22 kilometers. And at the same time, it was also the most efficient car. So the most efficient car in the field and the fastest car in the field because of its low mass and yeah, bioethanol powered engine. And since it was that, su since it was that successful, 
we, yeah, thought, well, the new competition was starting, the electric class in our uh, competition. Let's take up a new challenge and build an electric car. And we built a rear-wheel driven electric car, which was focused on reliability. So we wanted a reliable car to be able to score well in the competition. And since it was that successful, again, we, well, we wanted to make an, another challenge. And we posed ourselves the question, what concept would be the best if you want to build a lightweight electric car? And then immediately, yeah, we didn't come up with it because it's a known, known concept, but we went for four-wheel drive. Because of course, when you have a four-wheel driven car, uh, imagine that you're driving very fast and you start braking, you feel that you are pushed forwards yeah, since, the car, since the mass of the car is going to your front axle and there is more energy in the front of your car. Well, this, this means that when we uh, regenerate our energy, since an electric motor can regenerate its energy, it can work like a dynamo, it um, allowed us to regenerate a lot more energy and decrease the weight of our battery pack. And because our battery, weight, battery pack weight was decreased, we could decrease our chassis weight, and we could decrease the weight for our suspension. And that saved a lot of weight, but then we also have less mass which we have to propel, so the entire battery mass could be lighter again, since you need less energy to propel yourself. And yeah, this was a very successful car. We, uh, in October, we uh, did a world record attempt with it, because it was yeah, that light, that fast. We put a small girl in the car to, uh, to go a bit faster. <laughs> we heated uh, our tires to uh, the optimal uh, temperature, since uh, yeah, that also saves us uh, some time. And we even uh, sprayed the uh, tarmac with a bit of uh, sugar water solution. And then uh, we could achieve such an amazing time, 2.134 seconds. So uh, yeah, it's really amazing. And um, yeah, how do our engineers become better by doing such projects? How can they become better? Well, in our year, I will now explain you how our year looks like. In the beginning of the year, we start with a blank sheet of paper. A blank sheet of paper requires our engineers to look for all sorts of different and innovative solutions to, yeah, come up with an, a nice design for our car. So those innovative solutions and concepts are worked out during the first half year of our, of our yeah, process, our design process. And then after that year, we start production. And all our engineers, they quickly see that their design is flawed and they need to improve their design since, yeah, if you're designing something for the first time, you make mistakes. And with these mistakes, they become better again and they don't make them, hopefully don't make them anymore in, in the future. So, yeah, basically our project is, yeah, our engineers have a unique way to develop themselves with our project. They uh, learn how to be innovative, they learn how to uh, they acquire the knowledge to yeah, become better engineers and tackle all sorts of problems which arise during the, re during the, re during the re year, sorry. And um, yeah, lastly, lastly, they can make something unique, learn to make unique things, like for instance, our four-wheel driven electric car, which is the fastest car in the world. Thank you. Next up, we will have Serge Coll, the managing director in Accenture's Brussels office. Uh, he has expen extensive experience in the definition and implementation of large-scale transformation programs for utilities across all components in the value chain. And welcome. <laughs> okay. So I was going to say thank you very much for the kind introduction. That's, that's probably already too much uh, information. 
So I was thinking of a way probably to get your heart rate a little bit down after the race cars, but I think this pretty much uh, did the trick already. The uh, introduction from a consultant is always a bit difficult. But this being said, so many thanks for having us. So we're delighted to, to sponsoring also this event. So I think it's fantastic. I like the formats. I'm very excited by the discussions. And I'm hoping that also today, you know, that we will be able to share a couple of uh, interesting thoughts uh, when it comes to sustainability. Now, the topic that I wanted to talk about is really to give you a perspective of how business sees sustainability today. And the basis for that is a study which we have done for the United Nations last year, so that was 2013, where we have interviewed 1,000 CEOs representing 27 industries, and basically they were in over 100 different countries. And this makes it the biggest study ever done with business, if you want, on sustainability. And the idea was to capture their thoughts, where are you, where should we be going, or where are you going, and what are your views uh, on the topic. Now, I think 2013, I mean, this was a very important year, I think, also to do a study like that. Because if you consider it, we are at a turning point. Economy starts to pick up again, still some uncertainty, but we see this growth. And there is a choice to be made about how is it that we want to grow. Now, I think everybody agrees that we need sustainable growth. There is still, however, quite a lot of debate about what is the pace that we are seeking. So do we want to have incremental change, so incremental change towards a more sustainable environment economy, or does it need to be more radical, more transformational? So is it evolution or revolution? So that is really a big question. Now, I will let you answer that question for yourself, but maybe just a couple of facts for consideration. If we think, first of all, about 2050, we are projected to be 9 billion people. 9 billion people. Now, if we consume the way we consume today, and if we produce the way we produce today, we will not be sufficient to have just one Earth. We will need 2.3 Earths. Seems impossible. Secondly, if we go a little bit closer to today, 2030, we are expected to need 50% more food than what we have today in production. Problem is that we will probably also be short by 40% on the water supplies. Now, if you think about this 2030, and then we can debate about, you know, is the projection realistic, isn't it too aggressive, whatever. But, you know, nonetheless, 2030, so that's 15 years from now, 16 years from now, to change an economy, to change a society, this is basically tomorrow. So I think we're pretty much convinced that we need to have probably a more radical approach and that we need to do more. Now, if you think about the results of that study, so I'm gonna give you some statistics, so hopefully not too much, but at least to give you a sense also of where those guys stand, so those thousand CEOs of those big companies. First of all, they definitely recognize the challenge. I think that it was about 32% that felt that we are on the right track. Well, you can still think, who are those guys? Can they please stand up so that we can finger point them? But 32% say, okay, we're fine. But two thirds say we're not in good shape, basically. It was about the same amount of people that said that business definitely should be doing more. So they felt we are not basically up to the challenge right now and we should be doing more. So there's definitely work ahead. So that is recognized. Now, interestingly enough, we had a similar inquiry, if you want, in 2010. And what we are seeing is that actually the number of people that qualified this sustainability challenge as being very important is going down. So not up, it's going down. So despite all the troubles in the climate that we start to seeing, so we see more and more evidence, interest was going down. So it, it went down from 54% who qualified it as very important. And then, okay, fortunately, 40% said it's important. But the 54% nonetheless went down to, to, uh, to, uh, to 45. So this is quite puzzling. And so we ask ourselves, why is that? Why is that? Why is it going down? And why do we still see that they recognize this as being important, etc.? And what we saw is that there is really a big level of frustration right now in the business community around sustainability. And this is a frustration with themselves as a company. I already talked a little bit about that. But they were also frustrated with their consumers, frustrated with their shareholders, frustrated with government. So really a lot of frustration. Now, I already talked about how they were frustrated by themselves, claiming that they're not doing enough. But it's probably also more interesting to understand, so why is that? Now, they keep on repeating that they have a number of blocking factors, if you want, but the two that keep on coming back as being the most high ranked are, on the one hand, the difficulty to basically make an immediate link with business value, 
And I think we talked about that. So profit, profit, you know, where's the profit hat compared to the mom and dad hats? I will, not, I remember, I will remember that one. But so it is a real challenge that they recognize. And then secondly, there was also difficulty to really measure in the right way where, what is the impact that we are making. So really some blocking factors. This other frustration comes from consumers. And I think this is also easy for all of us to relate to that, I think. Whilst on the one hand, they were saying that, you know, this is absolutely a very big, important buyer value, and we are confident that consumers value the fact that, you know, sustainable, what, that their product is being made and distributed in a sustainable way. While they believe that, I think it was close to 70% said that, we have only half that thought that one day, maybe, sustainability, if you want, would be a buyer value equally important to price or to quality or to availability of a certain product. So basically what we're saying is that our consumers say it's important, but you know, end of the day, they just want to have it cheap. And I think we can make that consideration as we're looking for new clothes or a new TV or whatever. You know, do you always think like, you know, how was this produced and was it useful that it came to me like this or with a boat or whatever, polluting? So that's certainly a lot of frustration. The other one comes from the shareholders. And this is, by the way, where we saw the most extreme numbers. 12%, so consider that, 12% of CEOs said that they were getting any guidance from their shareholders as to sustainable behavior. So you could say pretty much the investors, they don't really care. It's a bit black and white, but you know, that's what it was. And I think less than a third said that you know, if we think about their share price, there's no link. You know, only well, less than a third said that there was a link. So two thirds said there's really no link between my share price and sustainability. So certainly a complication. I think on the flip side, they said it, it would become more important, but the interest pretty much is low. And then finally, the last frustration was with government. And I think this came back on several places. But the point is that in many cases, the business community will say, we are ready to make the investment. We are ready to compete, you know, according to more sustainable, if you want, rules. But they also said we want a level playing field. So if we over here, if we need to abide by certain rules, we would expect that the same competitor of ours who sits on the other side of the world has to abide to the same rules. And that, of course, is a problem. And there's other factors that come into play, but this was certainly a key one that was also creating a lot of frustration. Now, despite all the doom and gloom, so I'm not, I'm not only uh, talking about doom and gloom, despite all the doom and gloom, there were certainly also, I think, there are some, uh, some important uh, lace or rays of light. One element was that we had an overwhelming vote of trust, if you want, on the importance of sustainability for the future and the ability to create even a competitive advantage or to fuel growth and innovation. So on those questions, it's like 80%, 90%. So, you know, will this make the difference for you? The answer is overwhelmingly yes. Problem, of course, if you look at all of this now, is timing again. Evolution or revolution, think about that. Now, the good thing is that this might be, or this might be, if you want, a big part of the business community right now. The fact of the matter is that some people are already acting in a different way. And we had one of the speakers talking about that as well, also in the beginning of, the, of, the, of, uh, of our session here. But it is true that there are some leaders out there who basically manage to do both. Really be winning in the markets as such by all standard financial measures, if you want, and at the same time display very strong leadership when it comes also to sustainability. And we have our, uh, an institute at Accenture, which is uh, you know, the high performance uh, institute, where we analyze the DNA, if you want, of companies that are high performers. And we've been looking at those, and what we see in there is that obviously not everybody in there is a leader on sustainability, but there's definitely a couple of leading companies in there that actually inspire and that can inspire other companies and that can inspire also a real difference, even also with their consumers. And there we see that some real examples pop up also at scale. Siemens, for instance, is one where you know, they have their environmental division, which right now is already 40% of total market share, 33 billion euros, and they grow at more than 10% per year. Or you have a company like Philips right now, you know, this is a television company, or used to be a television company, at least this is you know, mentally how we still know them, but 50% you know, of their business right now comes from their green solutions, certainly, and they develop those, uh, those uh, lighting solutions, for instance, that were also mentioned today. So we have those real leaders already out there, and they make the difference, and they basically compete successfully 
embracing the change and embracing the technology that will lead, that will lead to a different marketplace. So I think the summary right now from the business community is that I think they're not there yet. The importance is there. There is a problem with timing, but I think we should hope that there will be more of those inspirational leaders that actually either dominate the markets and they will just kill off if you want in the competition than the ones that are not so successful and that don't embrace it or that cannot make differentiation or they might inspire also the other ones. And I think that we as consumers, we should definitely buy their products. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Daniel Dobeni, the president of the Renewable Energy Club, who is going to talk to us about the role of creativity and technology in determining the future of our energy. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's the first time I have the privilege to talk with, to a TEDx uh, uh, event. And it just occurred to me during the, uh, the break that the only two guys with a tie are the one coming from a uh, large corporation. So uh, I don't know if it's something to do with that. So um, first of all, I, I'm very happy we, we had the, the previous speakers. Uh, if, I, if I would try what popped up in my mind during we were listening is uh, I was listening was first with vision. I do not 100% agree with everything you said. I will come back on that, but I, there is a vision, there is leadership, we had innovation, we had research, and we have practical implementation of electric cars. So what are we missing, ladies and gentlemen? Do you have an idea? Money? Maybe. What else? In Europe, what are we missing? Any idea? First of all, I would say political will. When you speak about feeding tariffs, uh, in fact, feeding tariff is, is really the trigger of the renewable energy sources in Europe. Without it, we wouldn't be today with wind and solar energy and, and research uh, of an amplitude like I've never seen in my whole career about energy efficiency, combining energies, etc. Of course, it distorts the market to some extent because by providing a financial support to those technologies, it allows those technologies to offer the electricity on the stock market, on the power market, I mean, at their marginal cost, which is close to zero, driving the cost down, which brings another part of the whole value chain of electricity in trouble. So it has very positive effect it has also negative <coughs> impact. The second thing we need is, is technology. Uh, we heard from the second speaker that the technology is there. Not entirely, unfortunately. Or fortunately, it all depends. Uh, we have a lot of technologies. Uh, I'm, I'm some sort of geek myself since I'm 13 years old, so with my iPhone, I can control my home. I've written the software myself. It's fantastic everything you can do. It's not plug and play. Far away from being able to see my parents, who are still very wealthy, fortunately, doing it at home. So we need to bring the technology in a stage where every one of us can use it. We have so how difficult it can be with the Echo Nation to go from an idea to a product or to a service. You need different kinds of knowledge and expertise from the finance side, the engineering side, the marketing side, everything is needed. So we need political will, we need technology, we need customers. And this is where Serge is a point. I'm like everyone else, I presume in this room. I'm ordering more and more from the websites because it's easy, they deliver at home. I have no hope to go to any shops anymore. But on the same time, I'm usually buying the lowest price for the best specification. 
And this is where it hurts, because we cannot do the transition to the vision without accepting to pay more. Unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. Moving from what we have today, which is around 30% renewable energy sources in Europe, to 20 in 2020 year, knowing that for electricity, it means 33% to 35% of renewable share in the demand of all Europe, means a significant effort. And I'm not talking about going to 2030, 40, and 50. And we need also this whole European power system to completely be revamped. Do you have an idea how much installed generation we have in Europe, roughly? No? A little bit more than 900 megawatt, gigawatt, sorry. What means a gigawatt? It's roughly one nuclear power plant or 2.5 gas power plants. So it's not nothing. And all those machines are rotating exactly at 3,000 revolution per minute so that they can deliver the 50 hertz, 50 cycle uh, alternating current you have at home. So knowing that this product is very special, electricity is a unique product. It doesn't exist in a reliable way in the nature. And we customers, we cannot live without it for a minute. So we need something in between that makes it. We use some fuel, or we use wind, or we use sun. And then we have a power system that is there to ensure that at all time, when you go home, or when you're in the office, whatever you want, you have the exact amount of electricity you need. Whatever you need for 535 million consumers in Europe. We have roughly more than 300,000 kilometers of line and cables of high voltage and very high voltage. It's one of the most significant realization of humankind. I think there is nothing that is equivalent to today. It works 24 hours a day, and it's so good we haven't forgotten that it may fail. So the problem, ladies and gentlemen, when we move from the current situation that we have built through the last 100 years in Europe to the next one, the vision in 2050, or 40, or 60, who cares? You cannot stop the system. You cannot say, oh, hold on, guys. We are going to work for, let us say, a month without electricity, and we will do an update. We will change everywhere. And then we start again. So it's like starting for Europe from 28 different airports with 28 different kinds of airplanes with consumers in these airplanes and we expect in 2050 or 40 or 60 to have one single airplane consuming not fuel any fuel at all and the people in the airplane have not seen anything it just happened like that and it even not costing more money this ladies and gentlemen unfortunately cannot be achieved. You need for that political will, cooperation between governments, cooperation between companies, innovation and creativity. And that's the reason why I choose this title for you. Innovation is important because innovation is doing always better, 10 times better as we heard. But for what we are going to do in terms of the power system, it's insufficient. We need creativity. We need to think how to use energy different way. The best, the best kilowatt hour is the one you don't use. But that's easy to do, not easy to do, easy to set. So how do we move the whole society to this new paradigm? For this, you need very strong political message. Because it's quite impossible to achieve everything all together. Very low price, very high reliability, and sustainability. We will have it someday. Because you're right, the day everything is in renewable and everything has been depreciated, it's gonna be pretty cheap. But this is not where we are living today. 
I've, I've been, been for, for 10 years uh, the CEO of, of a company called Ilia, who is the transmission system operator in Belgium and one of the four German TSOs. There's never been such a change in the way this, the whole power system is run like the last 10 years. And many things that I was personally considering as being nearly impossible are possible. We can always go further, but it's not necessary an easy way forward. And I, you don't need even to be part of a large country like the USA or China. By the way, do you know how many windmills are connected to the China grid every day, or every hour, or every week? Do you have an idea? Yeah? One windmill uh, an hour. So 24 windmills a day are connected to the China grid. The Asian country have taken over the amount of renewable they're installing. And it's not just done. So renewable is there to stay. So it's not a question about how are we going to stop it. Sometimes I can read that in the media. It's how we can ensure that we can integrate it the most efficient way. And I'm very proud of saying I'm Belgian. I'm very proud of saying that, that uh, Belgium is, is, is one of the country with the, the highest number of, of creative entrepreneurship and innovation in terms of renewable. And this is also because we have a very strong support from, from uh, the, the, the four different ministers. Uh, by the way, you know that in my 15-year in my career in transmission of electricity, I had 27 ministers. <laughs> hard to beat, very hard to beat. Um, so we, we've been able to develop such a technology, having this expertise, having people really passionate in order to make it happen. It took hours, days, nights for people who tried to have the first windmills in place in order to overcome all the administrative difficulties to achieve that. And I, I would like to show you a few of these, uh, uh, yeah, world premiere, if I, if I may say so. So these are uh, the, the uh, most uh, important windmills you can find. These are the biggest in terms of uh, installed capacity and they are located in the North Sea of the Belgian coast. You can see a, a nice picture with and without the clouds. Usually clouds are there in Belgium. <laughs> that, by the way, they all come from UK. Ah, that's, that's <laughs> awesome. um, we have also uh, uh, storage. We have also in Belgium uh, a very unique uh, storage facility that is installed, the biggest in the world using chemical reactions to, sol to s store electricity. We have also in, in engineering people that have worked to the uh, one of the uh, most significant, the largest power, efficiency of 60%, ladies and gentlemen, concentrated solar power uh, that is installed uh, on this planet. And we have also uh, uh, the largest uh, water uh, treatment, uh, wastewater treatment, that will con converse this, uh, convert this uh, wastewater in energy. These are all uh, activities that have been developed in Belgium. And one of the, the main role of the uh, Renewable Energy Club that I have the honor to chair uh, is in fact to promote this technology on an international basis. And for this to happen, we need passionate, enthusiastic, clever engineers, economists, lawyers, commercial people, just name it, we need them. And, and they are in this room. So, so uh, in my very short speech, what I tried to show you is that there is no better place to work today than in the power system business. It's a complete system that needs to be overhauled in the next 20 to 40 years. The best challenges are there. We need your creativity and we need your innovation. Thank you. Thank you very much.
very much to all our great speakers. We have now almost reached the end of our program. But this afternoon, while we were in the theater, 18 students from six different schools in Belgium and the Netherlands were working with the St. John's IB teachers in the school labs to um, explore different ideas for sustainable energy. These students were all selected based on ideas they submitted for new renewable energy products and applications. One of the students was selected because her idea especially stood out from the other ones. I'd like to invite Maëlys Decorde from the local school Ecole de Crolly, and please give her a big round of applause because she just turned 16 yesterday. So my idea, based, it's set in south of Sahara in Africa where half of the population doesn't have access to electricity and only a small minority to gas. So for cooking, they either use gas bottles or wood, but for charging their phones, listening to the radio, or even lights, they have to use batteries. But these batteries are a real nuisance. They're very polluting, and they're seen as the most toxic industry on the planet when recycled. Women and children put their lives on the line for recycling batteries. You can see them in the bottom right picture. My idea addresses this problem. I would use some of the empty gas bottles and fill them with compressed air. Then attach a micro turbine to the bottle, and this will produce a current, a part of, sorry, an electricity of about five volts, enough to charge your phone or light a lead at night. There are a few advantages to this new system. First one is that the compressed air can be made with alternative energies. Then they keep energy longer inside than the batteries because the bottles are made or designed to keep air or gas inside of them. And they're not polluting because it's air. And batteries, they're lead. And it's really bad for the environment. In Africa, as you know, it's really warm. And batteries lose energy with heat. However, that air, it gains efficiency and productivity with temperature. If you remain your, if you remember your fourth grade physics, PV equals NRT. It doesn't wear down because it's air, it has a very low impact on the actual material. And the, there's a crank to use when the bottle is empty. Because sometimes you need to have energy right away, but you don't have access to air or compressed air. And lastly, we would use ideally open hardware to make it accessible for everyone. Of course, we need to check a few things. Firstly, there's the efficien efficiency, because it will work, but how well will it work? Then there's the security, because gas under too much pressure tends to explode. Then comes the accessibility, because we would use open hardware and 3D printing so that people of Africa can make their own micro turbines and not have to buy it from a shop and have even more problems. And lastly, they have to be cheaper than batteries because honestly, no one wants to do something pricier than what they already have. You must be asking, how do we actually get the compressed air inside the bottles? Very good question. Well, the obvious reason way would be to use gas pumps and the tire machine things to get the air that's already inside of them into the bottle. But we have to find another way because we cannot rely on just one way. So we could use alternative energies like solar power or wind power, waterfalls, or even biogas to power pumps <coughs> to compress air and get them inside the bottle. Thank you for listening and I hope Idea will find itself its way in Africa. Thank you very much.
very much for this innovative idea, and we have now reached the end of this TED Talk. I hope you had a good time, and I'd like to thank all the speakers again for their innovative speeches, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced your names. I did my best. And also, thank you to all you audience members. Without you, this event wouldn't have been possible. So there will be, again, a networking reception outside on your right, the drinks, and I hope you had a good time and learned a lot and are more aware of the state of energy in our world today. Thank you. <laughs>